Software testing. The part of software development you skip in your personal projects because you don't think it's worth it. Yes, you, I'm talking to you, you know yourself. But here's the thing, just because you skip it in side projects doesn't mean it's optional in the real world. Software testing isn't new, it's been around almost as long as software itself. But even with all the progress in development tools and methodologies, one thing hasn't changed. No software is completely bug free. Not Gmail, not VS Code or your favorite social media app and that's never going to change. Why? Because at the end of the day, software is written by people and people make mistakes. Even the most experienced engineers following the most rigorous testing practices can miss edge cases or face unexpected scenarios. The software itself doesn't live in a vacuum either. It evolves, it interacts with different devices, operating systems, browsers, and much more. Each one of those variations introduces potential new issues and as we update, patch, or expand the code base, new bugs can sneak in even when we fixed old ones. Some bugs even lay dormant for years, hiding in plain sight, waiting for the right set of circumstances to appear. Take the year 2000 problem or the Y2K bug. For decades, developers stored years using two digits, 78 for 1978, 99 for 1999 to save memory. It worked just fine until the year 2000 approached. When computers read 00 as 1900 instead of 2000, it created widespread concern that banking systems, flight schedules, and government records would fail. This bug stayed hidden for years because no one had ever tested dates outside the 1900 to 1999 range. It was a future-proofing failure and it highlights why we test. Testing is how we manage risks. We can't predict everything that'll happen, but we can try to protect against the most likely and most dangerous failures. That said, it's impossible to test every single scenario. So we use different types of tests, each covering parts of the system, and in this video, I'll be going through some of the most popular testing strategies used in software development today. Let's get into it. Software testing generally falls under two broad categories, functional and non-functional testing. Let's start with the first, functional testing. Functional testing checks that the software behaves the way it's supposed to. It's about making sure inputs produce the right outputs and that features work according to the requirement. Let's say we're building a file sharing approval app for a team. Users should be able to log in, upload documents, trigger an approval workflow, and eventually archive the file. Functional testing would verify that users can log in with the valid credentials, upload files, preview them, kick off approvals, and archive the documents when they're done. Each step is validated to make sure it does what it's supposed to do. Now, let's look at some type of functional testing. The first is unit tests. Unit tests are the foundation. They focus on the smallest piece of code, individual functions, methods, or modules, and verify that they work in isolation. For example, you might have a function like this that checks whether a document upload is valid. The function checks the file name, file extension, and the file size. A unit test for the function might look something like this, where we check various combinations of the file name and sizes to confirm the logic is correct and working how we expect it to. Unit tests are written by developers during development. They allow bugs to be caught early and make it easier to debug issues since failures are scoped to just a specific piece of code. But not everything should be unit tested. A common mistake is writing unit tests that incorporate external systems like API calls, databases, or file storage. This is an anti-pattern because those systems can introduce flaky tests. Tests that can sometimes pass or sometimes fail, often due to things outside your control, like network instability or service downtime. To avoid this, we use mocking. Mocks simulate the behavior of external systems so you can focus on the logic in your code. Instead of connecting to a real database to test login logic, you can mock a database call to return a valid user or an error and test how your code responds. Now, once the individual units work, the next step is to make sure they work together, and that's where integration testing comes in. It checks that components interact correctly. For our file sharing app, we might write integration tests to verify that after uploading a file, the system kicks off an approval workflow and logs the event in the activity log. Some integration tests can also include interactions with external systems, like calling third-party APIs and making sure the response is processed correctly. It's all about making sure the seams between the parts of your systems work correctly. The next series of tests are called systems tests. Here, we step up a level and test the application as a whole. System testing ensures that the complete integrated software meets all the functional requirements. For our file sharing app, this can include everything from login to file upload and archiving, all tested in one big flow. System testing often involves several types of tests. One of them is end-to-end -end tests. End-to-end -end tests simulates the complete user journey. For example, a test might start by logging in, uploading a file, assigning it for approval, waiting for the response, and then archiving it. If it all passes, then everything looks good. It's a realistic walkthrough that mimics how a real user would interact with the application. 
Another type of system test is the smoke test. Smoke tests are quick tests to make sure that the core features work after a new deployment or a major code change. Say we just deployed a new version of our app. A smoke test might check, does the app load? Can I log in? Can I upload a file? If any of these things fail, then there's no point in running deeper tests yet. We need to fix the basics. Next, there's acceptance testing and user acceptance testing. Acceptance testing checks whether the system meets the business requirements and is ready for release. The quality assurance team or the business stakeholders typically do this test. User acceptance test usually takes this further by putting the software in the hands of the actual users to see if it meets their real world workflows. Now, functional testing is all about asking one question. Does this thing work properly? But just because something works doesn't mean it works well. That's where the second category of testing comes in, non-functional testing. Non-functional testing focuses on how the system performs, not just whether it functions. It covers things like performance, security, usability, scalability, and much more. One example of non-functional testing is load testing. It evaluates how a system performs under pressure. Say our file sharing system is expected to handle 10,000 concurrent uploads. Load testing simulates that volume to see if the system can hold up or if it crashes. Tools like JMeter or Gatling can help simulate traffic that can help us answer questions like how fast can files be uploaded during peak hours? When does the system start slowing down? How many users can be logged in at once before performance starts to tank? Another example of non-functional testing is security tests. It checks for vulnerabilities, things like injection attacks, unauthorized access, or data leakage. For example, you'd want to test whether users can access documents they don't own or if someone can bypass authentication using forged tokens. Some techniques for security testing include penetration testing, trying to break into the system, static code analysis, finding weak spots in the code, and risk assessment, understanding potential threats. So to recap, software testing should always start with unit tests to verify the code in small chunks. Then we move to integration testing to make sure those bigger modules work perfectly fine together. Next, we run systems tests, including end-to-end -end tests and smoke tests to verify everything works as a whole. Then comes acceptance tests, where we validate business goals and users' needs. Finally, we run non-functional tests, like load and security testing, to ensure the system performs well and stays safe. Early on, tools like JUnit and Mokito can help with unit tests and integration tests. Later on, tools like Selenium make end-to-end -end tests and user acceptance testing easier to manage. Now, of course, there are many more types of tests. There's regression tests, API test, black box test, white box text, and much more, but they're all forms of system test and support the same goal, making the software better. Choosing the right tools at the right time will help make your testing more effective and less painful. At the end of the day, tests are your safety net. They give you confidence that your code works as expected and that future changes won't break things quietly. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos like this. And if you want to hear more about the world of software engineering beyond writing code, Check out Beyond the Build podcast, hosted by me and my good friend. We talk about everything that makes this field what it is, from soft skills to career growth and everything in between. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next one. Peace.